Hey, it's Jen. Have you ever listened to one of the episodes and thought to yourself, oh, I wish I could leave a response to that, or I wish I could leave feedback or ask a question? Did you know there's actually a way to do that in Spotify now? I know, it's super cool. So if you head over to Spotify and search for Java with Jen podcast or Java with Jen hearing God's voice for everyday life, you may have to search all of it. And then you go and check out my most recent episodes. There are polls and Q&A options that you can weigh in on and I can connect with you that way over here on this platform. I usually use Instagram to connect with you guys, but now with this feature from Spotify, it's a super cool way to engage with the content of each episode and talk to me directly. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. So go head over to my latest episodes on Spotify and let's do that right now. So have you ever stood around in a group and someone cracks a joke, and apparently it's an inside joke because you totally don't understand, but everybody else in the group is dying laughing. And you're like, hey, can someone explain this to me? Well, maybe you've experienced that at church where the preacher's preaching and makes a comment about fasting or about discipleship or discernment or tithing or anything like this. And you're just like, um, can someone please explain what they're talking about, what story they're referring to, what concept I'm supposed to understand, and you just feel a little lost and realize in that moment, hey, it'd be really great if someone could explain to me what that is. Well, for the month of May, I'm hitting some of those topics that are commonly referenced but not commonly explained, and fasting is one of those. In Bible school, we had to fast every other week and honestly, it took years before I finally got a revelation about why it was so significant. Nobody could actually explain it to me very well. So I have some fun pointers and insights I'm going to throw into this episode. We're going to tackle the most common questions. And as usual, contact me and let me know if there are topics you have heard referenced at church and not understood and you'd like explained as well. I can always add to this series. All right, let's cue up that intro music. Hi, and you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenna Lee Samuel. All right, so before I dive in, just so you know what's coming in life hacks, I talk about my most favorite product for tanning for those of you who are super fair like myself. Um, there's a product I love for tanning my body. It's all natural, all organic, and it goes a long way. I bought it last summer, used it all summer, and I still have enough that I'm using it this summer. So, and it's kind of middle of the road pricing. It's not super expensive. So, um, and it comes, I have a discount code to get you 15% off. So that's in life hacks. So make sure you listen through for that. Okay. So for today's topic with fasting, I love that there was a couple of you guys that sent in some questions um, for me. And so I'm going to dive into what is fasting, why is it powerful, and hit some of the most commonly asked questions. Um, so we're just going to hit it real like practical, real practical through it all. Um, so let's dive in. Fasting is something that recently actually is a more popular common topic with intermittent fasting. Uh, fasting is not just a spiritual discipline. It's also a physical health discipline. So there's a spiritual aspect to it, which is what we'll be talking about today. But there is a physical health aspect where it's actually just really good for your body. It's everything that God, of course, asks us to do is going to produce life. And so if you do have a lifestyle of intermittent fasting or just regular fasting where you go without food for a period of time, um, it's just... It's just going to help your body. It helps kind of reset your digestion a bit and kind of ease things up through the stomach and all of that. So it's actually a really great discipline. But to define it, fasting is to abstain from all food and to, or to eat only like sparingly or certain kinds of foods, especially as a religious practice. So some people I've heard use the phrase, I'm fasting from social media. Now, if we're going to be technical, scripturally, the word fasting, the concept of fasting is always in relationship to food. There's nowhere in scripture that says, you know, fasting from um, waking up early or fasting from a thing that is not food. We see self-control. We see discipline. We see abstaining. 
So I think some people maybe use that word interchangeably with fasting. Um, but technically, the discipline of fasting that Jesus asks us to do is actually always in reference to food. So if that makes you want to freak out a little bit because you don't love actual fasting and you'd way rather fast social media, it's okay. Where I'm going to explain why it's actually really powerful. Um, also, for those of you who want to dive deeper into this subject, um, the Lord had called me onto a 40-day fast like quite a few years ago. It was a partial fast. I didn't like go without anything for 40 days, but um, he also had me read the book by Jensen Franklin called Fasting. And I read that. I really recommend reading about fasting when you're on a prolonged fast because it will help really keep you motivated to stay engaged and to be diligent. Um, and so that fast really changed my life about fasting in general. I fell in love with fasting and I saw a ton of miracles. Um, and I even prayed in a couple spouses. I've noticed that when I'm fasting, uh, there, I just have this unique uh, I don't know if you call it an anointing, a gifting, whatever, that I can pray in spouses. I don't know if that's because I've had a marriage that came with a lot of challenges. So the Lord is like, hey, you've invested a lot. You're going to reap a lot, you know, but I have prayed in lots of spouses, especially when I'm fasting, probably about a dozen of them. So if you're single and you're like, hey, I really want a spouse, drop me a message and I'll begin to pray for you. Um, but it also goes to show fasting is unique and brings certain kinds of breakthrough. So fasting technically and practically is about abstaining from food. James 4.8 um, says basically it, in it, sorry, it can be self-initiated, spirit-led, or spirit initiated or leadership initiated. Sorry, forget James 4.8. I don't know why I brought that up. I don't have that written out here. Um, let me look it up because I don't want to miss out on anything really valuable. I'm working off of notes that I had pulled together a few years ago when I taught our college students about fasting. And so that's what I'm working off of right now. Uh, 4.8. Okay, says... Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's just about drawing near to the Lord. So when you choose to fast, it's a, it's, an, it's a gesture of drawing near to the Father, and he promises to respond to that. And so that's a promise you can stand on. If you're going to give up food in an effort to pursue the Father, it doesn't have to be a spirit-initiated fast. It can be self-initiated. I want to connect with the Lord, so I'm going to fast because I'm desperate to seek him. God honors that. God responds to it. So it can be self-initiated. It can be spirit-initiated, like I said, where the Lord asked me to do a 40-day fast, or leadership-initiated, where your pastor maybe, or um, you know, maybe your spouse says, hey, in our home, let's do a New Year's fast. The pastor says, hey, we're fasting leading up to Pentecost. Our church is actually in a church-wide fast for that purpose right now. Um, so there are different ways it can be initiated. The whole point of fasting is that you're having a pure, sincere, engaged heart about it. And the whole point is, of course, intimacy with the Lord. It's not just a spiritual discipline. It can be, um, it's not like a time of famine. It's actually a time of spiritual feasting. So your body is going without, but what it does is it actually sharpens your sensitivity spiritually. The best way I can think to describe that is like, you have five senses, right? And so if you lose your sense of sight, Usually what happens is those people experience that their other four senses become heightened to accommodate for that loss of sight. Okay, so it's like our, our body compensates like that. Well, you, you physically, when you're feeding your body, it's not that it dulls your spiritual senses, but it can actually. That if you are always feeding your flesh, it, it's going to be harder to be in tune with and in touch with your spirit man. And so some people will intentionally starve their flesh by fasting or in other ways, getting off of social media, etc., cetera, um, so that they can sharpen their hearing and engagement with their spirit and with the spirit of God. And so fasting is kind of like when you lose a sense and your other ones sharpen, it's basically kind of like that. I don't know how else to describe it, but when you choose to put your physical senses aside and not make those top priority, but instead you make your spirit top priority, God honors that and he responds to that, okay? Private victories bring public power 
and reward. Remember this. Private victories, those things you battle for in private that no one sees, will bring public power and reward. Matthew chapter 6 says that when you fast, don't put on, he said, don't do like the hypocrites do where they twist their faces and they look sad and depressed and they put on a show so everyone knows that they're fasting. He said, their reward is in heaven. I don't, I don't want you to do it that way. He said, instead, get dressed up, put yourself together, look fresh and go about doing it in secret. And God who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. And so that actually tackles one of our first questions that came in. I had, um, um, oh shoot, uh, Bradley. Bradley messaged me and said, hey, if I let people know or if I tell someone that I fasted, even after it's over, do I lose my reward for it? And that was a great question. Um, and I think he's probably referring to this passage about doing it in secret. Here's what I'm going to say. There's a difference between doing something in secret and, and, and trying to be discreet with it and doing something um, publicly. Okay, sorry, let me rephrase that. There's a difference between doing something publicly and in such a way that you're trying to get attention versus just communicating that it's happening because you need to communicate it. For example, there's private things that happen in our lives all the time. Maybe a conflict with your spouse, maybe a physical issue with your body or whatever. And we keep those things discreet on purpose, just for wisdom, just for maturity, whatever. But there is always a time and a place where it's appropriate to talk about or maybe reveal what's happening to the right person at the right time. So with fasting, it's not that if you tell someone you're fasting, suddenly you lose your reward. It's not about that. God is addressing the heart behind it where he's saying, hey, listen, if you're trying to get a reward, you're trying to feed your pride by showing off that you're being so spiritual. Well, good grief, you're missing the whole point of fasting. The whole point of fasting is to starve your flesh, not feed your flesh. So he's like, don't do a spiritual discipline that's meant to starve your flesh only to feed your, the pride of your flesh by bragging about it. Does that make sense? And so the point is not that if you say a word, you're going to lose your reward. The point is don't be boastful about it. You're not, you're trying to starve your flesh, not feed your flesh. And if you're being braggy, you're feeding your flesh. The point is like, I've had people, you know, if I, if I host someone and I'm making a meal for them, but they're in a fast, well, they don't want to come over and be rude and not eat the food I've prepared. And so in that moment, they have to communicate to me, hey, I'm in a fast. Here's the parameters of my fast. And so that way I can honor the parameters of their fast. Does that make sense? They don't lose their reward for that. That's just a situation where discretion requires they actually share that information with me. So same thing if like my husband will tell me, hey, I'm going to be fasting on Monday, so don't bother making me dinner. He's not bragging. He doesn't lose his reward. He's just communicating where it's important to communicate it, right? If your marriage is having issue, you're discreet with the general public, but you're honest with your counselor, right? If your body is having an issue, you're discreet with the public, but you're honest with your doctor, right? So when you're fasting, be discreet about it. You're not trying to brag and draw attention, but there is a time and a place for sharing it with the right people. So I hope that answers that question for you, Bradley. Okay, so let's get into what kind of fast there are. If it's always about food, actually first, let me dive into why fasting is powerful because this will give you so much more value for everything else I'm going to say in this episode. When I was in Bible school, we used to have to fast every other Thursday. And quite frankly, everybody hated it. But in scripture, it's very clear that it says, when you tithe, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, um, these are the disciplines basically or scriptures that say when you do these things, then this is what's going to happen. And so the fact that scripture, I'm sorry, I, sh I would be better to have this verse right in front of me. I'm trying to see if it's in my notes somewhere. But um, when scripture lumps fasting in with prayer and giving generously, that goes to show that fasting is actually meant to be a regular, normal, built-in part of our life. It's a spiritual discipline. Back in Jesus' time, they had a regular habit of fasting. I think they did it 
every week or every month or something. They had regular seasons of fasting that was built into their culture. It was their their religious beliefs were such a a core part of their national culture that everybody did it. And so here in America, fasting is not really normal. It's talked about, it's kind of trendy right now, but it's not normal. Anyway, so spiritually speaking, I never understood why does fasting matter? Okay, it's good for the body. That's great. But there's passages that say, you know, where Jesus is talking to the disciples and they tried to cast out a demon and it wouldn't come out. But then Jesus prays and the demon goes out and they said, Master, what what did we do wrong? You know, like we prayed and nothing happened. And Jesus said that some demons only come out by prayer and fasting. And so people would always point to that scripture. They'd be like, well, fasting just makes you more powerful spiritually. And I was like, Okay, that doesn't help me. I don't know. I didn't have to cast out any demons today. So what's the point of me fasting? I don't understand. Nobody could explain it to me. So I was asking the Lord again and again. I was like, God, you've got to help me understand this. I don't want to just do things because it's just done. I always need to know the purpose. Like God always has purpose in everything. And so he brought me to Hebrews 2. I was reading it one day. Felt like he asked me to read it. Wasn't getting anything out of this chapter, which is crazy because it's a loaded chapter. Um, It's talking about how Jesus became like man. And because of that, it talks about our inheritance in in Christ. But in verse 14, listen listen to this. I was so thankful the Lord showed me this. Nobody explained this to me, but the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, it says, since the children, talking about us, have flesh and blood, He too, speaking of Jesus, shared in their humanity. And so when I got to that point in the verse, shared in their humanity, the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, okay, anything after this verse you have access to because Jesus shared in your humanity. He made himself like you, equal to you by sharing in your humanity. So after this, you have this as an inheritance. So I said, okay, said shared in their humanity so that by his death, He might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And so the Lord said, by Jesus' death, he destroyed him who held the power. Jesus died on the cross, but I am not literally going to the cross. However, scripturally, Paul says, I take up my cross daily. We should take up our cross daily. So the father said to me, generally, how do you die daily? How do you take up your cross? How do you demonstrate death on a consistent basis? And I thought about it and I realized, well, fasting is one way, dying to my flesh. And any time that I choose to literally die to my flesh, I'm stepping into death on purpose, like the concept of dying to my flesh. And so he said, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. It was Jesus' death on the cross that allowed him to destroy all the power of the devil. It was his death that did it. And he took back the keys of hell and the grave, right? We are filled with Christ. We have all inheritance in him. We, we I'm going to try not to use too churchy of language. Um, When you accept Jesus as your savior, you inherit everything that he purchased on the cross with his own death. But we also are meant to live like him, right? We're supposed to model our life after him. So while I may not go hang on a tree, I can choose to die to myself like Jesus did by choosing to put God's will above my own, by choosing to put others before myself, by choosing to walk in wisdom rather than just walking after the appetites of my flesh, of my human cravings or my pride or whatever. Those are ways we die. Fasting is a way that we die to our flesh in regard to food. Now, now if you're like me and you're like, well, why food? Why, why the heck food? Think about this. There are multiple places in scripture where food was the doorway for sin to come in or someone's inheritance to be lost. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? They ate an apple. They saw food. Their appetite, their carnal appetite caused them to step into sin and bring sin into the earth, okay? 
Back to Jesus and his death and us inheriting the death. When you choose to die to yourself, every time you choose to lay down your life and walk in humility instead of pride, every time you walk in selflessness instead of selfishness, every time you choose love when it's hard, every time you choose to go without food because you're fasting and seeking the Lord, you are stepping into the same anointing that Jesus obtained for you to step into, which allows you to destroy the works of the enemy, and overcome death, according to this passage. And there are many other scriptures that point to this. Um, Jesus said that we have a mandate to destroy the works of the enemy. This is part of our mission on the earth. So fasting is part of how you, what's the word? It's almost like you increase your authority in the spirit realm when you fast because you're choosing to, to rule over your flesh so that your spirit is the stronger part of who you are and you're stepping more consistently into that anointing that destroys death. Listen, when I do a fast, when I intentionally call this revelation to the front of my thinking, it emboldens my prayer, it emboldens my faith, it makes me contend for things I might not have the boldness or the faith to contend for otherwise. Y'all, I can't tell you how many miracles I have seen happen on fast. My shoulder has been healed in a fast. I've prayed in spouses in a fast. We've gotten breakthrough in our marriage and our family and relationships in fasts. And so fasting is not just a way to beef up your spiritual muscles. Fasting is literally a doorway for you to step into the authority and the anointing that Jesus made available to you to destroy the works of the enemy. Look how it is such a redemptive picture of what happened in the garden. In the garden, food caused Eve to step out of her authority. So now after the cross, Jesus provides fasting, which creates a doorway for us to step back into the authority that we have as sons of God, to destroy the work of the enemy. It comes full circle. Do you see that? It's just so cool. So that's what the Lord showed me about why fasting is so powerful and why some demons only go out through prayer and fasting because certain demons are just stronger. They're called strongman demons and they require a little bit more fortitude, a little bit more spiritual authority and strength. Now, don't go off the deep end and say, oh my gosh, are you saying I don't have like all authority in Christ Jesus, you have all authority in Christ Jesus. But it's kind of like, let me think of a good analogy. It's kind of like, have you ever been around someone who just has been through stuff? There's a weightiness about their life that you know has come through experience. They have authority on topics. Like if you've ever listened to a single person try to teach a class on how to be married, There's just like a little bit of a flimsiness of credibility to it, right? But when you listen to someone who's married, has been married for 40 years, and has gone through all the normal challenges that married couples go through, and they've hung in there, and they've built character, and been forged by it, there is a weightiness to their advice and their wisdom. There's just an anointing, if you will, because they've paid the price, Okay, so when you pay a price spiritually, you have all authority in Christ, but your anointing can increase. And your anointing, the anointing is the power of Christ that breaks the yoke and sets people free. And so you can actually increase, that's not what this message is about, so I'm going to get off this rabbit trail, but you can increase the anointing that you walk in, and fasting is one way to do that. One way. Not the only way, but one way. Okay, so let's get into types of fasts, okay? There's an absolute fast. I'll hit this fast. There's an absolute fast, which is extreme. It's for short periods of time, no food, no water, nothing. You need to make sure that your health is in appropriate place for this. You don't want to harm your health, right? Um, And so if it's an absolute fast, nothing, nothing, that's usually for short periods because you actually really do need water. (laughs) Like you need at least water. A normal fast is no food, but plenty of water. Broths and juices might be used if it's a little bit lengthier. Um, A partial fast can be limited to certain foods only or fasting between certain hours of the day, things like that. That's usually what I do. I usually do partial fasting. 
And then a 40-day fast is an example we see in scripture. We also see a 21-day fast. Daniel did this um, with uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego uh, with the king. And they did 40 day, or they did 21 days of just meat and what did they do? Just vegetables. I think it was just vegetables. Um, anyways, and so there's a reason for the 40-day one. I don't know if I want to get into that. Okay, I'll get into this. I can't go deep into it, but I just want to hit it because I thought it was pretty fascinating. But Jensen Franklin goes deeper into it in his book, Fasting. But there's a place in scripture, God does nothing without purpose, right? So there's a place in scripture where he calls Satan Beelzebub. Well, Beelzebub actually means Lord of the Flies. No one really knows why he calls him Lord of the Flies. Like nobody really can put that together. But Jensen points out, he said, well, if you look closely, like if God's going to call him Lord of the Flies, there's a clue there. Like flies is a clue to a way that Satan operates. And so if you look at flies, the lifespan of a fly is only 40 days. Okay. Now, if you have an infestation of flies and you are trying to um, depest your property and get rid of those flies, they constantly lay eggs. And they can at any point in their lifespan lay eggs. And so they live for 40 days. And so what you have to do is you actually have to spray and and treat this infestation every day for the full 40 days in order to completely wipe out the infestation. Because then if you only go 38 days, there's two days that any flies that survived could still lay eggs and can maintain the spread of what's what of the infestation. Well, if the Lord likened Satan to a fly, then what Jensen Franklin proposes is that there are some spiritual situations that have to be tackled in a 40-day fast that can't be tackled in a shorter fast or won't be fully accomplished in a shorter fast. He goes into it more deeply. It's a it's a it's like a spiritual equivalent to the fly's lifespan or whatever, but I thought it was particularly interesting. It kind of gave a little bit more purpose to why 40 days might be significant. Um, I know anytime I've done a 40 day fast, I think I've done two in my life. It, it was powerful. It was really life changing. And so if you're looking for a breakthrough with a child who needs to come back to the Lord or some really heavy, intense situation and a five day fast hasn't fixed it, a 10 day fast hasn't fixed it, consider doing a 40 day fast. There might just need to be some thorough um, intercession to deal with whatever stronghold or strong man might be binding up that situation. So I'm not going to go deep into that, but there's just the thought. I'm going to put it out there for anyone who wants to sink into that. Okay. So here are some situations where there was some falls related to food. Okay. I'm going to hit this real fast. Adam and Eve, she saw the tree that was good for food. She took it and ate it. And out came sin. They got kicked out of the garden. That's where we are. Sodom and Gomorrah. In Ezekiel, it says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor. She didn't give to the needy. They were prideful, committed abominations before me. And then I took them away as I saw fit. But it's interesting. They mention there was a fullness of food. The reason this is significant is because gluttony or gluttonousness is someone who we think of gluttony as just eating too much food. But the sin that drives gluttony is it's it's really it's a lack of self-discipline and self-control. It's just a constant feeding of the flesh. You can be gluttonous about how much TV you watch. You can be gluttonous about gossip. You can be gluttonous about anything. It's just you're demonstrating no restraint to the flesh. And so frequently gluttony shows up in reference to food. And when there is gluttony and an abundance of sin, ironically, there's oftentimes an abundance of food as well. Um, let's see here. Esau and Isaac, Genesis 25. Jacob gave Esau bread and a stew of lentils and went his way. And Esau gave up his birthright for soup. It was Esau was hungry for... I'm sorry, I didn't really share the whole story. Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau had a birthright back there in that culture. The oldest got a birthright. The youngest did not. 
And so Esau went out and had been hunting all day. And when he came back, he was starving so badly. He said, Jacob, make me some food. And Jacob said, well, I'll make you food if you'll give me your birthright. Esau said, fine, whatever, just give me some food. And so Esau literally gave up his birthright, his, his inheritance, the blessing of his father over his life for a bowl of food. So he gave up his spiritual and natural inheritance for a bowl of food. Um, let's see. Moses received the Ten Commandments. Okay, wait, wait, sorry. Um, the Israelites in Hebrews. Um, oh, sorry. The Israelites with manna, they were complaining for meat in the wilderness. When the Israelites left Egypt and they were going to the promised land, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 days. And God gave them manna from heaven, bread from heaven every day. But it says that... Um, the mixed multitude, all the Israelites, were among them yielded to intense craving. They were just hungry and they were, they were craving meat. The children of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? Remember in Egypt we had all these wonderful foods, cucumbers and melons and all this. Now we have nothing but manna. And they're complaining. And so God sent quail, so much quail that it was coming out their nostrils for a month. Um, and the meat was not satisfying to them because God was like, God was ticked off at their complaining. And so he threw so much meat at them. Actually, thousands of them ended up dying because they got so full on meat. It's crazy. But they complained their way straight out of the promised land. It was because of all their complaining, they got stuck in the wilderness. And when the, the quails and all that stuff got poured out, verse 18 through 20 and verse 34, they called that place Kibroth Hatava, which is graves of lusters, as a memorial to those who ate their way right out of the promised land. Those who complained and griped about the food that they didn't have ended up dying in the wilderness over their complaining and their lust for more, it says the graves of lusters. And so there's some, there's some kind of connection between the craving of our flesh and food and a spirit of lust or gluttony or like just that need to feed our flesh, right? And so I'm trying to show you the parallel here. So there's experiences throughout scripture where people missed out on their calling, traded their future, sin came in, through food. So here are some situations where there was breakthrough that came related to fasting. When Moses received the Ten Commandments, that was after a 40-day fast in the wilderness. Esther and the salvation of the Jews came after she called for a corporate three-day fast. Hannah received, she was distressed and was praying for a child in 1 Samuel 1, and God gave her Samuel, who became Israel's next prophet, and that was after she went through a fast. Daniel fasted to make a point to King Nebuchadnezzar about God's superiority, and that was a 21-day partial fast, um, but they got the breakthrough that they were after, and the king ended up serving the God of heaven and called all of his people to do as Daniel had done. Jesus fasted in the wilderness to deal with and overcome temptation. He was out there for 40 days, and that is what, that is what brought on the beginning of his ministry. It kicked off the beginning of his ministry. And if you'll notice in those 40 days, Jesus came head to head with the devil himself, with temptation. And so don't be surprised when you go into a fast, if you come head to head with temptation and you have to wrestle through some things where the devil has maybe, um, now Jesus, you know, didn't have any areas where the devil had a stronghold with him, but the devil still came to tempt him. And so don't be surprised when you go into a fast, if that you have to face down with temptation and maybe face down with your demons, if you know what I'm saying. And that's because at that point, that's your point of breakthrough. When you're facing down with those things, that is your point of either breakthrough or continued bondage. And so these things will come up in fasting. Okay, are you still with me? Let's see, how long have I been going? Oh my gosh, 30 minutes. Okay, let's hit some of these things very quickly. Um, what is not fasting? We hit this earlier, Facebook, TV, sleep, anything non-food is technically not fasting. It's abstaining, it's self-discipline, self-control, but it's not fasting. We hit Hebrews. What's an appropriate posture in fasting is humility, repentance. You are trying to starve your flesh so that you can feed your spirit. The goal is not just to go without food. The goal is to feed your spirit. So if you say, I'm fasting, but you don't put any more time into prayer or the word of God, you're not really fasting, you're just starving. So make sure that you replace the food time with Bible time, with prayer time and worship time. That is what makes it um, a fruitful fast. 
Okay, occasions for fasting, it could be because you need a breakthrough in your life, breakthrough in your finances, breakthrough in a relationship, maybe you need healing, you need some ideas, you need, to, you need direction about a relationship, literally anything that you need God's insight on or God to release um, his hand on a situation, that's a great opportunity for a fast. Or if you just want to go deeper with the Lord, do a fast. Um, I'm not going to go into all the examples. It's going to get too long for that. But the rewards for a fast, Isaiah 58 talks about this if you want to read more into it. But revelation and spiritual insight, healing is in verse 8. Your righteousness will open doors and pave a way for you. So opportunities may come through fasting. Favor from the Lord. I've been talking with the kids a lot about the role of God's favor in our lives and, and the importance of it. Um, destroying the enemy, answers to prayer in verse 8. Verse 9 is help from the Father, excuse me, intervention from the Father, deliverance, provision, literally anything you need help for, even to end a dry or dark season where night will become like noonday. This is another reason or, or benefit of a fast. Um, restoration, rebuilding, refreshing. Verse 10 talks about this, Isaiah 58, 10. Um, increased ministry effectiveness. All of these are purposes for a fast and benefits of fasting. Um, let's see. It's also been said that 30, 60, and 100 fold harvest when you're, when you're praying actually may be connected to giving, praying, and fasting found in Matthew 6. It says when you, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, it's been said that maybe that 30, 60, and 100 fold harvest is connected and correlates with those three things. So 30-fold being when you give, 60-fold being when you pray, 100-fold being when you fast. Just a thought, not going to build a theology around that, but that's been that's been speculated there too. So there's lots of rewards for fasting. If you want to dig deep into that, that's Isaiah 58. Should we only fast when we're individually led? What about corporate or self-initiated fasts? I kind of hit on this early earlier. If you're invited into a fast by your pastor, I would just simply pray, Lord, how do you want me to participate with this fast? So I have done it where I've just out of submission to authority and like a response to leadership say, yes, you're calling us on a 21 day fast. I will do it. And then I'll just ask the Lord, how should I do it? If my pastor doesn't give clear instruction or specific instruction, I'll ask the Lord because everyone's health is in a different place and diabetics you know, we'll have to be careful. People below low blood sugar have to be careful. So, um, you know, you, you still need to get some leading from the Lord. But the majority of fasts that I came across in scripture were corporate fasts. Esther, where she called for the national fast. Um, Daniel called for his guys to fast. Uh, different places where they went through mourning. The Jews went through mourning. The individual fast that I saw was Jesus when he went in the wilderness. Moses with the Ten Commandments. And Paul... When Paul did a, an individual fast right before he had all the revelation from the book of Revelations that followed an individual fast, Peter also did a fast. So we see both examples. And so you could respond to either. You could respond to either. What if I accidentally break my fast before it's over? Okay, so this is, this is great and there's grace. I remember I did a fast when I was in college. I think I've shared this on other episodes, but... I was, I was fasting because I wanted a pure heart and I felt like I was getting discouraged over all the, I don't know, self-serving motivations I saw inside myself. And so I went on a three-day fast. And so the second day I was sitting around with the girls in my room and they were passing around like Reese's peanut butter cups and we're all just talking, having a good time and I'm not paying attention. And so they hand me one and I pop one in my mouth and oh my gosh, it was so good. And I was like, wow, why was that so good? And I'm like, let me have another one. That was so good. I'm forgetting that I'm like a day and a half into my fast, right? And then right as I put the second one in my mouth, one of my roommates goes, wait, aren't you fasting? And I was like, ah! And so I like spit it out. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I was freaking out. But then I heard the Lord in my spirit. I heard the Lord laugh. And he said, he went, <laughs> he was like, oh, Jen, you are my pure in heart. And I was like, what? And it like totally caught me off guard. And I thought, Lord, you know, I'm not pure in heart. Like, you know, but he was like, you're my pure in heart. 
And I realized in that moment, the Lord calls us what we're not yet as though we are because he's calling us into that place. Um, But it also showed me how much grace he had because he knows our hearts. So if you make a mistake, you accidentally break your fast, repent and pick back up. God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Let's pick up where we left off. And sometimes if I feel like the grace is lifting for my fast, say I plan on doing 21 days and I'm 10 days in and I just suddenly it just feels like such a drudgery and there's no grace for it. I'll ask the Lord, Lord, should I end my fast early? And there have been times the Lord has had me end a fast early. So basically there's grace, apologize, pick it back up or ask the Lord if you should be ending it. Um, How do I end my fast? I like to end my fast personally with communion and some special time with the Lord to worship and process it. Um, Do not practical tool here. Do not end your fast, especially if it was an extreme one or really, really limited by going out and binging on junk. This will shock your body and it will hurt your body and you will regret it. The best way to ease out of a fast is the same way you eased in. Carefully work back in healthier foods like fruits, vegetables, grains, and lean meats. Keep it really clean for a while and just ease back in. Okay. And so be good to your body, be good to your metabolism. Just keep in mind that fasting is never really convenient. It is going to be inconvenient. And it seems like the moment you choose to start fasting is the moment when everything comes up and there's no no great reason for being on a fast. You're like, wow, all the motivation just went out the window. You're gonna just expect those moments, okay? Um, one other question Rosanna asked, How often should a believer fast? That is up to personal discretion. Um, I feel like as I've learned more about fasting and I see how it's meant to be built into our life, I, in different seasons, have pursued it on a discipline basis where I was doing intermittent fasting and I would skip breakfast and make sure I had a quiet time in that time. Um, I know one woman, she's just a woman of God and there's such an anointing on her life. And she, for years, sets aside Wednesdays from sunup to sundown. She fasts on Wednesdays and that's just her schedule. Just like you, you have a morning quiet time or an evening quiet time where you build in the discipline of reading the word, you can build in the discipline of fasting as well. Um, You have to, just like any other spiritual discipline, when you're not motivated, you need to constantly remind yourself of the why behind it and call yourself back into the purpose of it. And, um, you know, if, if you're really struggling, but you feel called to do it, but you're really struggling with having the right heart and the right posture for it, just ask the Lord, you know, to help. Um, and you know, just don't abuse yourself over the idea. It's meant to bring life. It's not meant to be bondage. So if it becomes bondage to you, you need to step back and evaluate. Fasting is a doorway to step into greater anointing to destroy the works of the enemy off of your life, the lives of your family, to access God's insight for anything that is in front of you. So I hope that helps answer some questions about fasting. If this brings up any questions for you guys, I hit a lot of this pretty quickly. Um, But if it brings up any more questions, just shoot them to me. And if I need to, I can do just a little short spiel during the week or I can throw stuff on on Instagram um, to kind of help answer some of those questions. Um, But hang in there because we've got Life Hacks next where I talk about a really cool product that I love for staying tan has nothing to do with fasting but has everything to do with feeling lovely when your skin is glow in the dark white like mine (laughs) so I hope this was helpful you guys um next week I'm gonna be hitting on I think discernment and then tithing or tongues I don't know like speaking in tongues um there was votes for both. So I may have to just record a number of episodes on these topics and pull them into next season because when June hits, I'm going to be doing a break or I might just give you a couple extra episodes right before the month is over just as a bonus to hold you over. So that's what's coming up. Stay tuned for Life Hacks and I will catch you next week. Okay, so for today's life hack, this is a product that I love. Now, for all of you fair-skinned beauties, male or female, 
Um, I came across this product. Actually, they found me on Instagram. And it was actually right after I posted a photo where I did a photo shoot and I was so white. And I think they found me like by the glow of my legs. They were like, hey, she needs our stuff. <laughs> and I'm so glad they did because their product, what I love about it, it's all natural ingredients. And so I don't, I don't have to worry about putting weird chemicals on my skin. Um, and what I love about it, it's actually a very natural tan glow. I used it a lot last summer when I first got it. And now that things are warming up, I'm using it again. And so it actually lasts quite a while. And I'm still using the original bottles I bought. And here we are a year later. But I love that they have one that's for the face. Um, that it's like got carrot seed oil and different things in it. It's, it's a lot milder and gentler. And so it's not quite as dramatic as the one that you put on your body. Um, and then the one that goes on your body, it smells really great. It um, Once it gets dried into your skin, it actually, my skin is so soft the next morning. It's crazy. And so I love that it's organic, natural ingredients inside this tanning spray. And it goes on really great. Of course, whenever you're tanning with a tanning product, you always have to be a little meticulous how you put it on. I find that once I apply it, if I take a dry towel and buff out the rough edges around my heel, around my ankles, between my toes, between my fingers, and around the edges of my feet and over like my knees or over any like rough patches of skin, um, that helps it not to like collect in those places. And then it gives it a very even natural blended look. So that's what I have found to be super helpful. Um, anyways, I just love it. I love this product. It's by Golden Star Beauty and you can find them on Instagram. I think their handle is golden underscore star underscore beauty. Um, you can also go to their website. It's goldenstarbeauty.com. And if you use my, uh, what's it called? My, uh, discount code, the discount code is J capital J Sam S A M for my last name, J Sam style. S-T-Y-L-E, J. Sam Style, which is my styling business. J. Samuel Styling is my styling business. Um, J. Sam Style will get you 15% off of the product. And so go check it out. You could do the face one and the body one, or you could do just the body. I use the spray. They may have other products. You can browse around and see what you like. But all of their stuff is natural and organic ingredients, and that's what I love about it. So if you're looking for a good tanning product, it's very middle road pricing, and so it's not going to break the bank. Um, and like I said, I bought my bottles. I bought one for the body, one for the face last year, and I'm still using it. And I used it all summer. I used it a little in the winter a couple times, and then I'm using it again. So it lasts. I think it's totally worth the investment. So go check it out, Golden Star Beauty. You can use J. Sam Style to get you 15% off and walk around with glowy, beautiful skin. All right, guys, thanks for listening to this episode. As usual, if you have any questions, send them to me on Instagram at Java with Jen. Um, also, for any of you who listen in the Anchor app, you can actually send me a voice message and I can actually add your voice message to an episode as like um, question and answer time or whatever. So I've never had anyone leave me a voice message in the Anchor app. So I kind of really want to try it out. So if anybody uses Anchor to listen to my podcast, would you send me a message on here? Because I really want to see how it works. <laughs> so otherwise, you guys are really great about reaching out on social media, Java with Jen, comments to come to Instagram. I'll check the DMs all the time. I'm on there every day. So send me a message if you had any questions of topics you hear pastors from the pulpit reference or mention that you've never had explained. Let me know because even if we get to the end of May, if I have a list from you guys of ones we want to tackle, I will pull those into season three because I love answering your questions. Um, and just as a reminder, June and July, I will be going on a season break. So I will not have a lot of active um, episodes. I might throw one or two like surprise episodes up in there. So it's going to be important you stay connected with me on Instagram because I'm going to keep all the updates happening over there. I will be rebranding just a little bit. My artwork for my podcast will change. So I'll let you know on Instagram what to look for, what it's going to look like. Um, there is a possibility possibility I might change the name of my podcast not sure I'm gonna be praying about it 
I'm considering a number of things. So pray for me, if you will. I want some clarity. I love Java with Jen. I just need some clarity. So anyhow, just be praying about all of that. Regardless, it'll still be me and it'll still be solid content, even if I'm um, fine tuning my packaging a little bit. So, uh, that's coming up in August, but otherwise the month of May, we're tackling these lesser explained topics. So make sure you stay tuned and share these episodes with someone that you have ever thought would like knowing about these topics, share the episodes and be sure to reach out on Instagram. And if you are listening, snap a screenshot, throw it in your stories and tag me so I can reshare and I can see who out there is listening. So, all right, love you guys. I will catch you next week. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. For those of you who've rated or shared this podcast on social media, thank you. Reading your comments and reviews always means so much to me. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say hey. It's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon, or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. Thank you to each of you for your ongoing support. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. Until next time, remember, you've got this and God's got you.